Hi guys in this video let's talk about a problem different bits some pair wise so this problem is also by the name hamming distance so basically it was asked in google in one of the interviews of google so let's see what the problem says so we define f of xy f is a function that takes two parameters x and y so it defines as the number of different corresponding bits in binary representation of x and y so f of 27 is equal to 2 how So two's representation in binary is this, and seven's representation is this, and both of these numbers differ at two bit positions. So first is this, and second is this, right? So therefore, the answer is two. Now you are given an array of n positive integers uh, from a one till a n. So you have to find the sum of f of a i comma a j for all pairs i and j such that i j lies between one to n. and you have to return the answer modulo 10 to the power 9 plus 7 right so basically you are given in this case if you see you'll given 1 3 and 7 so basically what you have to do you have to do f of you have to find f of 1 1 how will we find f of 1 1 so it's nothing but represented one in this form then again how many bits differ no bit right so it will give us zero now what about f of 1 3 so this is one right and 3 is this So there is just one position at which both uh, numbers differ. So therefore, it will give us one. What about one and five? So I have one and five is there. So there is again just one bit position at which they differ. So again, it will give me one. Now I have to find for one and five and five and one separately, right? I mean that means they are counted different. Okay. And also I have to find uh, for. Uh, One and one, five and five, three and three. Uh, so I'm talking about this particular array. So basically, if I have some i and j, then I have to calculate for both i, j, and j i. They are they are considered separate. As well as I have to calculate for i and i as well, right? So now let's see what what we can do about this problem, right? Let's see what we can do about this problem. So the brute force approach says that. we can pair up every element and find number of different pair of bits right so basically i can pair up every element every element right so i can have 1 1 so what are the pairs i so these are pairs are already written 1 1 1 3 1 5 3 1 3 3 so i'll take them separately and then i'll go over these their bits and then i'll find that okay they differ at these many positions and i'll return so if i'm pairing up every other element with every other element so i'll get the time complexity of order of n square but let's see if we can do better than this so let's talk about the optimized version for that let's build some intuition so basically we are saying that we want to count the number of ones number of ones right so basically we want to count the number of bits that differ right at every place so i have let's say i i places so i have 0 1 2 3 these many places are there in some number so i have right now my array is let's say so let me raise all of this let's say my array is 1 3 5 only right now and uh, So here I have zero zero one, here I have zero one one, and here I have one zero five. So that uh, sorry one zero one. So basically, I what I have to do, I have to check ki okay for every pair, I have to check ki every at what ith positions the bit differ. So I want to check that if some i if at some position bit bits differ or not. Now how can I check that? So basically, if I find the zor, if I find the zor. and if i get zero i know uh, that means the bits are same right so bits are same but that is not of my use right so i want to find where bits are different so basically bits will be different 0 1 or 1 0 when my zor will be 1 right when my zor will be 1 so i'll be trying to zor the bits and i'll look that how many ones are there right so if i would have given let's say 0 and 1 only so if this is only my number and the binary representation of them will be this only right so now i'll simply zor it and i'll get one and i'll simply return one but now now let's say i have zero so i have only single zero but now i have let's say three ones okay i have three ones so three ones are there 
so i'll do what now so i know that one pair of 0 and 1 will give me one bit it will tell me that if there is one pair which is 0 and 1 it will contribute to one bit right that it differs by one bit so now it was included for one pair so here i have one zero and let's say three ones so what i'll do what i'll do now so i'll associate the zero with one so now i know i want to find the different bits uh, so i'll be pairing up a different bits right i'll be pairing up zero one right zero and zero and one and one won't be of use to me so i'll be pairing the zero with this one then the zero with this one then the zero with this one essentially what am i doing i am trying to find the number of zeros how many number of zeros are there and i'll simply i'll simply multiply it with the number of ones that are there right so i'll simply multiply it with the number of ones that are there right so basically if i have three zeros and two ones so what i'll be doing i'll be associating every three zeros i'll be associating all the three zeros with all the ones right i'll be doing this isn't it so i'll be associating all of them so essentially i'm multiplying so 3 into 2 that means 6 six times they will be associated and that means six number of ones will be there right so essentially now what can we do instead of forming the pairs i was given 1 3 5 instead of forming the separate pairs right instead of forming the separate pairs what i can do is i can simply represent them in binary form so what i'll get i'll get uh, for 1 i'll get 0 0 1 for uh, 3 i'll get 0 1 1 then for 5 i'll get 1 0 1 right so what i can do is i can simply check i can simply go to every bit position every bit position and i can count the number of ones and number of zeros then i can simply multiply them up because each of those pair will be giving will be contributing one one right it will they'll be contributing one to the answer so i have this ith bit as zero one two so let's see let's see with the example okay let's see with the example so basically let's consider the uh, bit position one okay let's consider this part let me change the color so let's consider this part right so i have zero one and zero so if i were taking them separately so let's say if i were considering one and three so i get bit of one so one th bit of one and three is nothing but it's a zero and three is one right so now it will give me the zero of one that means these bits differ right and if i'll be taking for let's say one and five so here i have zero and in five i have zero so they give me zero because they don't differ now if i have three and five so here 3 is 1 and 5 is 0 so they give me 1 that means they differ so since i'm associating every 0 with every 1 so i'll simply count the number of at every ith position i'll simply count the number of ones and number of zeros so here my number of zeros is 2 and my number of ones is 1 so i'll simply do 2 into 1 that will give me 2 that will give me 2 now i also have to multiply it by 2 because since I am considering just not 1 and 3, but I will be considering 3 and 1 also, right? So therefore, they will give me same result, right? So I will simply multiply it by 2. So I will be calculating for this bit position, uh, whatever be my answer. Then I will be adding it to this bit position, whatever be my answer. Then I will be adding to th this bit position. So essentially, I will be adding all the answers bitwise. I will be checking all the answers bitwise. So let's see the pseudo code for this. So pseudo code goes something like this. So basically, I have defined my mod because I have to do mod the answer with this at the end. So I am given an array A, right? That will have the numbers that I have to find the humming distance for. So initially, my answer is at zero. Now I have kept a count for counting the number of zeros and number of ones, right? So here I have a count variable so i will traverse to all the bit positions so i am considering here that my that my integer is of 32 bit right so i i will be iterating to all the 32 bits right so it will start from the zeroth position and it will be moving to the most significant bit position right so from 0 to 31 i'll be going then my count is initially zero and uh, then then i'll be iterating over my array given array right then simply i'll be checking that 
what all bits are set so in case of 1 right so it's uh, 0th bit is set so this will this will essentially give me what this will give me so uh, aj in this case is 0, 0, 001 let's say so i have 1 3 and 5 with me so let's say aj in this case is nothing but 1 and 1 left shifted by i that means 1 left shifted by sorry so this shouldn't have no, no it's right so basically i is 0 i is 0 right so 1 left shifted by 0 it gives me what it gives me 1 only right so i'll have this now it will give me 1 that means this bit position is set in this number so it will give me true and i'll simply count now my count becomes it becomes 1 right so i'll simply iterate it over for all the elements now i'll go for my j will become 1 and i'll be going to 3 so now i'll check that okay 3 is this and again 1 left shifted by 0 it will give me 1 only right so i'll get 0 0 1 and again this this will give me what this will give me 1 that means this bit is set so this will return me true and i'll simply count increment my count to 2 right and at the end of iterating all these elements after checking there the bit the unit positions bit right then i'll so i have my count of the number of ones right and the count of the number of zeros will be nothing but num a number of elements that are there in the array minus the count. So that will give me the count of the number of zeros. And since we have seen previously that if I multiply them together, then I'll be associating every zero with every one and that will give me the set bit, right? And I'll be multiplying that with two because I'll be considering ij as well as ji separately right? And then I'll be adding that to my answer and I'll also be doing the mod modding it with or the mod which is here i have taken and then i'll simply return my answer so this is the approach and the complexity is going to be nothing but uh, the this loop will run for 32 times so it's going to be 32 and this loop will run for the number of elements in the array time so that means n so it's going to be 32 into n so thank you so much hello everyone Let's talk about a new problem today that is single number 2. What does this problem exactly say is that you will be given an array of integers and in this particular array every element is going to appear thrice except for one element which is going to appear only once. And your task is to find that particular element which does not appear thrice. I hope the question is clear. Let's look at an example now to understand it better, right? The first array contains all these elements, right? And in this array, you will see that there is only one element that is 4 that is appearing only once in this particular array. So for this array, for this first example input, the output is going to be 4. Now for the second example, you will see here that in the given array, there is only one element that is appearing once and that element is 1 and this element needs to be returned. So for this particular question, the output is going to be 1. Now, let's try to make some observation to see how we will solve this question, right? Now here, let us look at every bit position. Here, you will see that every number that appears thrice will either contribute to three ones or three zeros to that particular position, right? Also, the number that appears once, let's say that number is x, will contribute exactly one zero or one one to that particular position depending on whether it has zero or one in that position, right? So let's take an example to understand this. Let's say the array elements are four, four, four and two. Right. So if I write the bit values of these numbers, I will get this. Right. So here you will see that since 4 is occurring thrice, it is contributing to 3 ones at this particular bit position. And since 2 is occurring 1, so it is only contributing 1 0 to this position. Similarly, for this uh, so next bit position as well, three zeros are being contributed whereas only one one is being contributed and here three zeros are being contributed from the three fours and one zero is being contributed from the number two 
So you will see at every bit position, we will have either 3x plus 1 zeros, right? Or we will have 3x plus 1 ones, depending on the bit values of the number x, right? So these 3x, right? Since every number is appearing in a multiple of 3, so this x could be any common number, right? Uh, basically will be depending on the numbers which are occurring thrice and this will be the factor multiplied because each number is occurring thrice right so we will have these this factor 3x factor because every number is occurring thrice for the bit positions and this one factor will come because of a number which is uniquely occurring in the array right so using this observation we will solve our question right so let's take this example only and continue forward right the elements are 4 4 and 2 right so when i write these again right what i can just simply do is i can take the sum of the bit values at every position right i can just take the sum of the bit values at every position when i do this here i get 3 as my sum right i get 3 as my sum and when i take its mod by 3 only I will reduce or I will say get away from all the elements which are occurring thrice, right? I will get away from all these bits values. So when I take the mod with 3 of 3, I get a 0 here, right? Similarly, the process is followed here. When I take the sum, I get 1. I take a mod with 3, I get 1. So this bit, right, this bit which is here is presenting the bit which is actually left out, right? Because when I take the mod with 3, all the bits which are occurring thrice in a multiples of 3 are being cancelled out and the only left bit here is 1, right? And here also when I take the sum, I get 0 and when I take the mod with 3, I get 0 again, right? And when you get and whatever sum or whatever let's say the number you get in the end is actually the number which is occurring once, right? Here I get when I take the sum of all the bit positions and then take a mod by 3 and the end which is the number which is being formed is here 2 and I can simply say that this is the number which is occurring once. Now what will be the time complexity? You will see here that since we are let's say we are taking n bit numbers right we are taking n bit numbers and we are going over each bit and calculating its sum so the time complexity here is going to be order of n right and what about the space complexity you will see here that let's say we are taking the only numbers or numbers up to 32 bits so i can basically take an array i can basically take an array of size 32 and store the bits or the sum of the bits after taking the mod at every ith index only and since i am taking constant space of size 32 i can say that my space complexity is order of 32 which is equivalent to order of 1 only so i am taking a constant space here to solve this question and a time complexity of order of n i hope this question is clear to you thank you hi guys in this video let's talk about the problem trailing zeros in factorial of n. As per the problem description, we are given an integer n and we have to return the number of trailing zeros in factorial of n. So the, please note that your solution should be in logarithmic time complexity. As per the problem constraints, n lies between 1 to int max. And in the example input, we are given n as 5. The example output is 1 because the factorial of 5 is 120. Here there is only one trailing zero. So, therefore, we will simply return 1. Now, what is a trailing 0? So, if you look at here and if you say there are 3 trailing zeros, then you are wrong. Why? Because a trailing 0 is the one which is at the rightmost end and that has no non-zero number to the right of it. So, here there are only 2 trailing zeros. This will not be counted as a trailing 0. Let's see how can we approach this problem. So the brute force solution to this approach is that first we can calculate the factorial of n and then count trailing zeros in the result. So we can find the trailing zeros by repeatedly dividing the factorial by 10 till the remainder is 0. So what do we mean by that? So let's say the factorial, the n is equal to 10. 
and we'll do 1 into 2 into 3 into 4 into 5 into 6 into 7 into 8 into 9 and into 10. This will give us the number as 362880. Now to find the trailing zeros, we will simply mod it with 10 to get the last, zero, uh, last digit. So we will get 0. Now since this is 0, we will simply increment our count. Next, we will divide the number by 10 to check the next number, the next digit that means this number. So after dividing it, we will get nothing but 362880. So that means this, this digit has been removed, the last digit. Now we have got this. Now in the next iteration, we will simply do the mod of it to get the last digit. We got it as 0. So again, we will increment the count. Next, we will divide it by 10. Right, so here we have divided it by 10. Again, find the mod of it and we get a non-zero number. That means here we have to stop because we have found out all the trailing zeros. And since we have got a non-zero numbers, that means we do not care what is there at the left of it. Right. So we will simply stop and return the count. And this is what written in this snippet that we have uh, got the factorial as 120 of 5 when n is 5. So we will run our loop till this factorial is greater than 0. So if f mod 10 is equal to is equal to 0, we will simply count it up and we will divide f by 10. And else if it's not 0, then we will simply break because we do not care what is there on the left. And we will simply return the count. But the problem with this approach is that the above method can cause overflow for even slightly bigger numbers as the factorial of a number is a big number. So even if the number is as small as let's say 22, then it's going to cause overflow because the factorial of a, even a small number is so big that it can it is certain to cause overflow right therefore this method is not the appropriate one so what should we do now let's see what is a better approach so how can we find a trailing zero in any number so when a number is multiplied by 10 we get a trailing zero right so let's see 24 if it's multiplied by 10 we get 240 so, so here we have got a trailing zero just because we have multiplied it by, by 10. Then we have let's say 240 and if we multiply it by 10, we get 22400. We have got another zero which is contributed by this 10. Right. So in 2400, if we do into 10, we will get 24000. So another zero which is contributed by 10. So here there is an observation to make that a number if multiplied by 10, uh, by 10 it will give us a trailing zero. So for example, if n is equal to 10, then we'll get this as the, this is the uh, factorial of 10. So 1 into 2 into 3 into 4 into 5 into 6 into 7 into 8 into 9 into 10. The factorial is this and we can see that there are two zeros, the two trailing zeros. That means there must be num uh, two tens, right? There must be number of ten tens is equal to two that are contributing to two zeros. So how are we getting that? So 1, 10 is here and 1, 10 is formed by the combination of 2 and 5. So if we multiply 2 and 5, we will get 1, 10, right? So this is 1, 10 and we will get 1, 10 from here. So that accounts to two zeros. So this tells us that if in a number, we look at the number of pairs of 2 into 5, then we will be able to count the number of trailing zeros. So if if in a number we look at that how many number of twos are there and how many number of fives are there then we take the smaller number we take the smaller power of a number let's say 2 is x and 5 is y so let's say y is smaller than x then we will take this the number of fives and that is going to be the answer why because let's see with the help of this example so in this case the power of two is three that means there are number of twos as three so this is one and two into two gives us four so one two three so there are two threes and five is just one right so five will pair up with a single two to form a ten therefore we will look at a lesser power from between two and five right now, do we really need to find the power of 2? Do we really need to find a power of 2? Well, here the observation is to be made that if we carefully look, 
then every second number is a multiple of 2 and every fifth number is a multiple of 5. So if we are just able to find the power of 5, then they can pair up with that many number of 2s to produce a trailing 0. So let's look above uh, with the help of example. So in this case, every alternative number, so this is a multiple of 2, then this is a multiple of 2, 6 is a multiple of 2, 8 is a multiple of 2, then 10 is a multiple of 2. So at every second number, we are able to find the multiple of 2, which will give us uh, the number of 2s, right? That will give us the number of 2s. And every fifth number, every fifth number is going to be the uh, multiple of 5 that will contribute to a power of 5, right? That will contribute to the power of 5. So, as we can see that the number of multiples of 2 are greater than number of multiples of 5, that means we are going to get more number of 2s as compared to 5. So, the number of 2s are going to be greater as compared to the number of 5. So, we need not calculate the power of 2. Instead, we can simply calculate the number of 5s or the power of 5. So, the problem has now reduced to finding the power of 5. So, this is a generalized equation like if we want to find a power of any number, then we can apply this formula. Here, our x is equal to 5. So here we are actually trying to find the power of 5 and let this be any number, the remaining number which when multiplied with the power of 5 gives us factorial n. So how, how can we find the power of 5 or how can we calculate the number of 5? So for that purpose, we can simply take the floor of n by 5. For example, let's say n is equal to 11. Now n by 5 gives us 2.2. The floor of 2.2 is nothing but 2. That means the factorial of n is going to have two zeros. If we see here, then the factorial of 11 is nothing but 3991680. So there are two zeros, the two trailing zeros. Because in 11, how many multiples of 5 are there? It's 5 and 10. So this has contributed to 1, 5 and this has contributed to 1, 5. Therefore, the total number of 5s are 2 and therefore the trailing 0 is trailing zeros are 2. But we are not through yet. Why? Because what about if n is equal to 28? What will happen in that case? So if n is equal to 28, so in, in, in 28 factorial, what are the multiples of 5? So the multiples of 5 are 5 itself, then 10, 15, 20 and 25. 5 will contribute to 1, 5, then 10 will contribute to another 5, 15, uh, another 5, 20 will also contribute to 1, 5. But here 25 is going to contribute to 2, 5s. So by taking floor of n by 5 with the formula n by 5 and taking floor of it, we'll get 1, 5, right? So if we do n by 5, that means 28 by 5, this is going to give us uh, 5 only, right? So that means here we are going to get just 5 zeros. But here we can see that there are 6 zeros in total. So for getting the left out 5, that means the 5 which is still to be counted, we'll have to divide it by next power of 5, which is 25. So now we actually have to calculate the power of 25. But now what about 128? So in that case, we'll get 125 as well in the multiples of 128 factorial, the multiples of 5 in 128 factorial. So it's going to be 5, 10, 15, uh, then 20, 25, 30 and so on. Then 125 as well, right? So which has, so 125 has three number of 5s. So after dividing by 5 and then by 25, we'll still be left with one more 5. So for that, we'll have to divide it with the next power of 5, which is 125 to remove the, to actually get the last, the third 5. Now, the formula has become, so the count of number of 5s in factors, in prime factors of n factorial, it's equal to floor of n by 5 plus floor of n by 25 plus the floor of n by 125 
and so on till the number is greater than n by power of 5 so the time complexity of this approach is going to be order of log base 5 n what was the uh, question that we have to find the logarithmic time complexity and we have actually achieved that so why because we are incrementally dividing n by powers of 5 so first we are dividing n by 5 then n by 25 then n by 125 so on till n by 5 to the power k which reduces to 1 and n by 5 to the power k is equal to 1 so n is equal to 5 to the power k after taking log both sides we will get k as log base 5 n that means log base 5 n number of steps we have to take to get the solution and therefore the time complexity is going to be order of log base 5 n So this was it. Well, let's talk about the problem. Anagrams. So given an array of strings, you have to return all groups of strings that are anagrams. Represent a group by a list of integers representing the index in the original list. Let's look at this sample case for clarification. So an anagram is a word, a phrase, or name formed by rearranging the letters of another. For example, spar and rasp. both are anagrams because they have same set of characters the frequency of characters are same but only the order is different right also note that all input characters all inputs will be in the lower case so for example the input is cat dog god and tca so you have to return 1 4 and 2 3 so basically we have cat over here then dog then god and tca so this is 1 2 3 4 right so cat and uh, tca they are anagrams because they have same set of characters uh, even the frequency is same but the order is different right so we have taken them together that means 1 and 4 are together likewise dog and god they both are anagrams because again the characters are same the frequency is same but the order is different so 2 and 3 are anagrams so we have to basically return the answer like this now here in the explanation it's written that cat and tc are anagrams which correspond to index 1 and 4 dog and god are another set of anagrams which correspond to index 2 and 3 so the indices are one based the first element has index 1 instead of 0 so let's see how can we approach this problem so the solution approach is that we can sort the given strings now how does this intuition came so basically from the question itself it said that anagrams are the words that have different order of the same set of characters so if we sort both the strings then if those strings become equal that means they are anagrams right because the order was different only but they have same characters so if we sort them then the strings which are anagrams will become equal and after that we can simply group them together right so here we have got the input as act dgo dgo and act so we have actually got them by sorting the individual strings given in the input so act represents cat dgo represents dog and dgo again represents god and act represent tca right so we have basically sorted them now we know that a group of anagrams can be represented by a key which is nothing but the string we get after sorting characters present in those strings right so here both cat and tca are anagrams and they can be represented by a string which is act so this we have got after sorting the characters present in them so now to group the strings basically we can perform hashing so how can we do that so a key can be the string right this unique string here the group of anagram is cat and tca right so we can have a unique string from for them which is act likewise for dog and god we can have a unique string as dgo so we can have a string and then we can have value as vector of int because we have to basically keep track of the indices of the anagrams right 
so now we will simply iterate over this array the sorted array so first we are at act then act is not present in our map so let's put the string and the index present is one so let's put it in the vector right now we are at dgo right so dgo is also not present in the map so let's put it in the map and the frequency uh, and the index present is two so let's put it in the vector now let's move ahead so dgo is already present in the map now let's include the index right so we have included three now we are at the fourth position and act is already present in the map so let's simply include the index so here we have the set of anagrams represented by their indices now the only task is uh, which is left that is to iterate over them and store it in the vector right so here we have vector 1 and 4 and we have a vector 2 and 3 so we will push them into a vector and we will simply return this in our answer right also we will only put the vector in this uh, resultant vector which have a size of greater than 1 right if a string has size of just so if the vector has size of just 1 then that means there is no anagram present for that particular string so we can simply ignore that right so now for the time complexity let's look at how we are going to sort the strings so for sorting the string basically we can perform counting sort we are able to perform counting sort because here the range of characters is fixed right which is 26 so we have 26 characters and therefore the complexity is going to be order of n into k where n is the number of strings and k represents the length of the longest string so the time complexity turns out to be order of n into k now if we don't want to sort the strings up then we have an another approach as well so we can actually maintain a frequency array right now what is a frequency array so let's suppose we have this as a string to form a frequency array of this we will have a character set we will have an array of 26 characters which have a range from 0 to 25 so why 26 because we are in the input we are given that only lowercase alphabets will be there right so we maintain a frequency array of 20 size 26 now basically we will be mapping a small a to index 0 then small b to index 1 and so on and we will be representing small z by index 25 so basically here we will be storing the frequency of all the characters so frequency of 0 denotes that it is the frequency of character a and so on here the frequency of a is nothing but 1 so we will put 1 over here then frequency so basically we will be iterating over the string so let's do that so here b is there and frequency of b is nothing but 1 so at index 1 we will put 1 now b is nothing but only 1 so let's put th uh, 1 at index 3 right then a is there so let's put 1 at index 0 then c is there so let's put 1 at index 2 and e is there so let's put 1 at index 4 initially all will be initialized to 0 so here's how we have built this frequency array and likewise we can do for this string as well and if the frequency array of both these strings come out to be equal that means they are anagrams of each other and likewise we can check this for all the strings given in the array so for this purpose we can basically have a map where the key can be instead of string it can be the vector of int so here it represents the frequency array the strings having the same frequency array will be pushed to this to the corresponding vector so let's see how we will maintain this so here we have cat right frequency array for cat will look something like this so here in this this will be the key right since this is, was not present so first we will be pushing it right and then we will be placing this one over here then we will be moving on to dog and frequency array of this will look something like this and we will simply put two over here right then we will move on to god right the frequency array of god will look something like this so we will put three over here and for tca the frequency array will look something like this so we will put four over here 
so that's how we can do it and then the last thing left will be to simply iterate this like we did previously and return the answer the time complexity for this approach is going to be so for creating frequency array for a string it's going to be order of k where k is the length of the string and the total time complexity will be order of n into k where n are then n is the number of the strings so it's going to be order of n into k so this was it thank you so much hi guys in this video let's talk about the problem longest substring without repeating characters so given a string we have to find the length of the longest substring without repeating characters for example the longest substring without repeating letters for this particular string is just abc right so if we look here then this is the longest substring which is of the length 3 therefore we will simply return the length right this is 3 for uh, this particular string and for the next case which is this so the longest substring is the single letter b right because if we consider any other substring then b and b repeats so therefore there is just a single letter here and therefore we will return the length 1 so now how can we approach this problem let's see that so there is a brute force solution which says that we can consider all substrings one by one and check for each substring whether it contains all unique characters or not so the total number of substrings are n into n plus 1 by 2 and to check if a substring contains all unique characters or not we can keep a map of the visited characters therefore this step can be done in a linear time the total time complexity of calculating all the substrings and then checking if they contain unique characters or not so the time complexity is going to be order of n cube let's understand this with the help of an example so this is the string let's suppose a b c b e then what are the what are all the substrings that can be present with the starting from a so we can have just a then a b then a b c then a b c b then a b c b e right to check if the substring have Uh, the unique characters or not for that we can use either map or we can use a set if we use a map then we can have a mapping from character to integer which which will store the character in a present substring and the frequency of that character and in the set we can simply store the character only to check its occurrence now starting from a we can have all these uh, substrings so at present we have just a let's suppose this is the first string and for now we are just considering a set so a is not present so let's put a and le let's maintain a length variable so length at present the maximum length is just 1 right now let's move to the next substring so which is ab so right now ab a is not present so let's put into a into the set okay and b is not present so let's put b into the set now the maximum length is 2 now let's move to the next uh, substring so which is abc A is not present. Let's put A into the set. B is not present. Let's put B into the set. C is not present. Let's put C into the set. The length, a uh, maximum length is three now. Let's move to the next substring now, which is A B C B. So A is not present. Let's put A. B is not present. Let's put B. C is not present. Let's put C. Now B is present already, right? B is present. So now. even if we move further even if we check for the next string then we can say that if this string cannot contain the unique characters that means uh, string starting from this current i cannot consist of the unique characters so that means let's move the let's check for next substrings so let's check substring starting from b so let's initialize it so starting from b we have just b then bc then bcb and bcbe right so for just b we can check that okay b is not present so let's put it but the maximum length is going to be 3 only let's check for the next substring which is bc so b is not present let's put b c is not present let's put c still the maximum length is going to be 3 now let's check for the next substring so b is not present let's put b over here c is not present let's put c over here b now this b pre is present right b is present so uh, what should we do if we move even further that will tell us that okay it won't help us because the b is repeating so we can move simply to the next substring starting from c so c c b c b e likewise we will keep on checking and we will keep on iterating till we have completely iterated this string right the complexity for this is going to be order of n cube 
which is pretty huge. So can we optimize it? Well, yes, let's see. So this can be further optimized if we check whether the substring consists of unique characters or not while moving the second pointer only. So what can we do? So the substring is A, B, C, B, E. Right now I is at here, right? And J is also starting from here. So A is not present. Let's put A into the set. So let's put A into the set. Now let's move J. Length right now is 1. So B is also not present. Let's put B into the set. And now length is 2. Let's move J. C is not present. Let's put C into the set. Now length is 3. And let's move J. Now B is present. So what should we do? Now we will be moving our I. So I will come over here. And J will also start from here now. So B is not present. Let's put B. And length will still be 3 only because that's the maximum. Right. Now let's move J. C is not present. Let's put C. Right, length will be same. J is not, uh, so B, when J is incremented, it comes to B and B is already present. That means we can simply increment our I now. So I will come to this location and J will also come to this location. Right, and we will keep on iterating and keep on checking this way. So C is not present, let's put C. Right, and length will still be 3 only because that's the maximum. Let's increment J. This B is not present, let's put B. Right, now increment J. E is not present, let's increment D, e, right? And the length is here is 3 and our present maximum length is also 3. So we need not update it. Now let's increment J. So now we have completely iterated over our string and therefore we can stop. And here we are checking the uniqueness of the characters in the string while iterating with jth pointer. So that will take the time complexity of order of n square, right? Now can we even optimize this further? Well, yes. We can do this function, we can do this in linear time as well. Well, let's see how. So we have A, A, B, C, B, E, right? Our I is starting from here. Let's maintain a set. So we have A over here. So length, current maximum length is just 1. Now let's increment J. So B is not present, let's put B and let's increment our length. Let's increment J. C is not there, let's put C and let's increment the length. Now let's increment J. B is already present now. Since B is already present, instead of moving, instead of just incrementing I to one position and moving J back to Ith location and restarting and checking all the substrings, can we uh, not move J any further? Can we just do something else? Well, we have to actually make sure that B does not exist, right? So, in that case, we can actually, instead of moving J back, we can increment our I till the point this Jth character does not exist in the set anymore. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's see. So, I is incremented and this particular character now can be erased from the set as it is no more in the current uh, window from I till J, right? So, A can be erased. Now, still the character at B is present in the set. So, we need to increase our I further. Let's increase it and let's remove this B now. Now, does this character at J is present in set? Well, no, it's not present, right? That means this B has just one occurrence now and let's put it in the set now. So, we have put the B and the present length is 2 which is less than the maximum length. So, we will keep this same. Let's increment J now. So, J will come to this position and E is also not present. So, we can put E into the set. And present maximum length is 3 and the current maximum length is also 3. So we need not update it. Right. And let's move our J now. So J has reached to the end of the string. And that means we have completely traversed our string. Right. And that's how we know that when to stop. So instead of moving J back, we have actually incremented our I till the J character does not exist in the set anymore. And that's how we are doing it in linear time. We are iterating over each character at most two times. So the complexity is 2 into n and in big O terms, it's just order of n, right? And the space complexity is also order of n where n is, is the length of the string. So thank you so much. Hi guys, in this video, let's talk about a problem finding the square root of integer. So given an integer n, you have to compute and return the square root of n. If n is not a perfect square, so return the floor of square root of n. 
and do it without using the square root function from the standard library. So the range of n is 1 from 1 to 10 to the power 9. Let's say the input is 11, so the output is 3. How? Because the square root of 11 is 3.316, therefore we will take the floor of it, so we will get 3 as the answer. Let's see how this problem can be approached. So one possible way is, we know that the range of our answer is going to lie from 1 to n, right? So we can simply iterate from 1 to n and we can check that if x square becomes equal to equal to n, then we can simply return the value of x. Else, if x square is less than n, then we know that this x is one possible answer and we'll check for higher values of x. So let's say some x plus 1, so the value just greater than x becomes greater than n, the square of it becomes greater than n. So we know the previous value did satisfy, so we will simply return the stored answer because any x greater than this will not satisfy the condition, right? will not be the answer. So let's see how can we optimize this problem because this will give a time complexity of order of n, linear time complexity. Then uh, now let's make some observation. Let's say I have some value of x. We know that it's going to range from 1 to n. Now this value could be x square could be equal to equal to n. In that case, we'll simply return x. But if it's less than n, then we know that the value lesser than x cannot be the answer right cannot be the answer it's quite possible that the value which is greater than x could be an answer x or any value greater than x can be one such answer so we can reduce our search space and then now we can search between from x to n right now the third condition is when x square is greater than n if this is the case then we know that any value which is greater than x, which is greater than x cannot be the answer. That means we should look to our left. That means we should look to our left. And we should also ignore this x because x square was greater than n. So here, from here comes the intuition to apply binary search because we have a search space and we have a, a conditions because of which we can reduce the space into half. So let's see the code for binary search. So here we will take, so if x equal to 0, we will simply return 0 and uh, otherwise we will put our start to 1 and end to x, right? Now this is going to be the while loop for the binary search. We will find the mid, so start plus end minus start by 2. This we have found our mid like uh, this way because this will avoid overflow, okay? And if mid is less than equal to x by mid, what this means that if if mid into mid is less than equal to x. Now this could cause overflow. Therefore, we'll write it like this, right? So first we have reduced the value and then we are checking. So if this condition becomes true, that means mid, mid is one such possible answer, right? So we will simply store the answer and we'll move to right. We'll move to right. Else, if this condition fails, then we'll move to our left. So at then we will simply return our answer. Now this particular binary search approach is going to take the complexity of order of log base to n. Let's see this with the help of an example. So here our n is equal to 10. The start is going to be 1 initially and end is going to be 10. Mid is 5. So 5 square is greater than 10, right? Therefore we should move to our left. So end will become mid minus 1 and 1 will remain same, S start will remain same. So mid is equal to 2, now 4 is less than 10, so we will move to our right and start will become mid plus 1 and 4 will remain same, end will remain same. Now mid is 3, 3 square is less than 10, so what we will do? So basically whenever we are getting it as less than uh, something, less than the value, so this particular number could be one possible answer. So first we have stored 2 because 2 square was less than 10. Then when we got 3 square less than 10, so we will simply store 3 now. Okay. And we will move to our right. So we will get uh, start equal to mid plus 1. This will remain same and we will get mid as 4. Now 4 square is greater than 10. So we will simply exit the while loop and we will return the stored answer which is 3. So that's the running of the algorithm. So thank you so much. 
Hello everyone, let's talk about a new problem today that is letter phone. In this problem, you will be given a digit string and you need to return all the possible letter combinations that the number could represent. Here, the mapping of digit 2 letters is very similar to the mapping you see on a telephone button. You must have seen the earlier phones that is the keypad phones which used to have different characters associated with each number, right? Here, you can see a similar representation where 2 is being mapped to A, B and C, 3 is being mapped to D, E, F, 4, G, H, I and similarly the rest of the numbers. Now, you will be given a combination of numbers in the form of a string that is a digit string like this in the given example. And you need to basically tell all the possible combinations that this number could represent, right? So for this particular number 23, I have for 2 A, B, C mapped and for 3 I have D, E, F mapped. And for the possible combinations, I could either have let's say A, D, A, E, A, F and similarly I could have B, D, B, E, B, F and so on. So at the end, we get all these possible combinations as our answer. So for a string 2, 3, I have basically 9 combinations. Right. So I hope the question is clear to you. And also, there is another constraint with the question that you need to return all the strings in the, all the strings, that is the, all the combinations basically, in a lexicographically sorted manner. Now, Let's see how will we solve this problem. Now, let's say instead of two values in an example, let's say I have a digit string of length 3. That is basically I have a combination or an, a concatenation of three numbers. Now, let's say the numbers are 7, 5 and 6. Now you will see here for 7, I can either have P, Q, R and S. Now, for 5, I can have J, K and L and for 6, I can have M, N and O. Now, you will see that for 7, I have 4 possibilities and for 5 and 6, I have 3 possibilities. Now, if you remember how exactly combinations work, so for in the, let's say, for the first place, I can place any of these 4 characters. For second place, I can place any of these three characters and for third place, I can place any of these three characters. That is, now, can you easily calculate what will be the total number of combinations? It can be very easily calculated by the fact by multiplying 4 into 3 into 3, which is going to be 4 into 9 and the answer is going to be 36. So now, by looking at the number of digit string that is the length of the digit string and the total possibilities for each position I can figure out the total number of combinations but the question is to find all those combinations and to return them in a lexicographical sorted manner right now let's think of it in terms of recursion we know in recursion that the smaller problem works and we assume that we will get the right solution for the smaller problem and somehow we need to use that solution to build a solution for the bigger problem, right? Now here, let's say the bigger problem is to find out the combinations for 7, 5 and 6 and let's say the combinations for the smaller problem is 56 and we already know the combinations for this, right? I know for 5 I have J, K and L and for 6 I have M, N and O, right? So what could be some of the possible combinations? I could have J, M, I could have J, N, I could have J, O, then I can have K, M, K, N, K, O and similarly. Now, I have the solution for 5 and 6 and somehow I need to use that solution to build the answer for 7, 5 and 6. Now I know for 7 I have P, Q, R and S. Now can you very easily observe here that by just 
then catenating p in front of all the combinations for 5 and 6 i can easily get the combinations for 7 5 and 6 and i can follow the similar position for the rest of the characters as well that is i will get strings of the form let's say p j m p j n p j o p k m p k n and similar like that once i have concatenated p in front of all the combination of 5 6 i will take q and do the similar thing right that is i will have j q j m q j n q j o similarly like that again for r i am going to follow the same thing and for s as well you can verify the number of combinations by another procedure that for 5, 6, I have 3 possibilities for 5 and 3 possibilities for 6. So the total values is going to be 7. Now I have 4 possibilities for 7 and I am attaching each of those 4 possibilities one by one to all the combinations for 5 and 6. That is P is going to be attached 9 times, Q going to be attached 9 times, similarly for R and S and the total number of combinations is going to be 36. So this is how we are using recursion and by using the solution of the smaller problem, building the solution for the bigger problem. Now, I hope the question is clear to you. Thank you.